So welcome everybody. I want to start over. We forgot to hit the record button. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight. And thank you to all of those who, who signed up and are not here with us in the physical and to all those that are staying up late uh, around other parts of the world um, to be here tonight in the, on the East Coast. Um, so I want to begin this story by as if we're walking into ceremony. And that is to honor and express gratitude um, for the spirits of the land from which this story first emerged, like spring, uh, like the crocus here in, in springtime, it first emerged out of ground. And that is in um, a place called Nubini, uh, Africa. It's a country there. And um, the name of the story in its original format is called The Nubian Woman. Although Plunge in the River says got to be one of those uh, other titles that got tagged to the story. So say I've had relationship with this particular story for 33 years. And so it first rose up out of the ground in Nubini, Africa. And it was told as a story of the initiatory journey or the, the journey of descent. Um, and I'll speak a little bit about journeys of descent before we dive in. Um, so it first rose up there a man, I think it was in the 1800s, late 1800s, a man by the name of Lawrence Vanderpost, uh, what back then would have been called an Africaneer or a European Africaneer, um, was spending time with this tribe and the story was gifted to him and then he brought it uh, out, you know, to the Western world. Um, but uh, Angelus Arian extracted it from him and Angela Sarian gave it to me, along with, of course, many other people. It's a story that she tells a lot as well. Um, in 33 years of being in a relationship with this story, if you know this story, you'll notice that it has been embellished and has taken quite a few turns and of uh, manifestations. While the plot line, I like to say, the plot line remains the same, uh, but the uh, ingredients of the story tend to shift. It may even change tonight. I'm not sure what's going to happen. Um, the, the front end of the story is a piece that I added to the story based on some of my travels and studies of indigenous cultures. <clears throat> so the, uh, the Nubian woman. And um, I mentioned this is a soul. This is a story of descent, the initiatory passage of descent. And if you think about uh, initiations as running in primarily two elemental arcs. You have initiations of descent, where the story takes you into water, and you have initiation, initiatory uh, arcs of ascent, where they take you into fire. And this is a story of descent, where we're going to go into water. Um, the other piece of introduction about the story is. Um, Initiatory stories of descent into water uh, are, are in the field of healing and memory and belonging and ancestral wounds and ancestral healing and remembering one's life purpose. So re reconciling uh, our ancestral threads in order to remember uh, what we are doing here and why we came here. So this is the, the ground that's being set for this story. Um, the other thing I want to tell you about stories, something I heard once from Angelus Arian, who said it's something like this, which is, um, if you understand the story, then the story is dead and it has nothing more to teach you. The point of medicine stories is not that you understand them, the point of medicine stories is that you enter into relationship with them and they with you to allow yourself to be touched by the story and to reach out and touch the story. And that way, medicine stories can be told hundreds, even thousands of time, times um, and the listeners will be in a different relationship with the story. So it's never about understanding, oh, I remember this story, this is what it's about and this is how it ends. Uh, no, it's about relationship. 
And um, it's, as we say, it, as I like to say, it's, um, it's not about the meaning you make about a story because meaning is fluid. It's like water. You can't hold meaning. It changes like a river running through your fingers. Um, when you enter into a relationship with story, you don't seek meaning. You notice three things generally. Where in the story do you first enter the story? And what's happening at that moment that the story reaches out and grabs you and pulls you in and all of a sudden you're there and that I may have started the story a few moments ago and uh, and three minutes into the story, something in the story grabs you and you're in and you don't know what was said before then. So what, what, uh, what in the story, what part of the story do you enter for the first time? So noticing that part of the relationship. Where in the story does your attention stop and the story keeps traveling, but you don't go with it. Uh, you may still be back there in that lodge with those grandmothers, or you may still be down at the bottom of that river with that old river hag. Um, and you don't even remember where the story went after that um, because your attention stopped there. That's another thing to notice. Where does your attention stop in the story and the story keeps going. The other thing to notice in stories <clears throat> is where in the story might you leave the story? So that if you're listening to a story and something in the story activates uh, a memory or a longing in you and you leave this story, and you go down a different road behind you somewhere in a memory or in front of you somewhere in a dream. Uh, you, you went there and you don't even know what happened here in this story. You, you don't hear any more of the story because you're there. So the, the important part of the story is what was happening here in this story opened the door that you left through. And where did you go? And what happened there? And how does what happened there relate to the place you left? So where you, where you enter the story, where your attention stops in a story, or where you leave a story, these are, the, these are the relational threshold moments of story that have the most medicine to offer you. That's why we say, and that's why it's said in Africa, if you understand the story, the story's dead, has nothing more to offer you. And so don't seek understanding, seek relationship. Um, it's the, as we know, the worst thing that can kill uh, the spontaneity and aliveness of any relationship is to trap somebody in a meaning of a story that you have about them. And then you can no longer see what's in, who's in front of you. So stories are like that. <clears throat> so just setting the ground for the story. Um, all right, I think we're ready to dive in. So I'm going to shift my screen back because I'm going to uh, get a little help with my drum to tell you this story. So I'm going to set this back here. Pull this down just a little bit. Ben, um, I'm going to use you since I can see you. Um, can you hear me well, Ben? Yeah, I can hear you. <clears throat> can you see the top of this drum? Yeah, uh, slant your screen down a little bit more, Cater. Uh, yeah, to yeah, that's perfect right there. Okay. So let's say entering a story is uh, like doing a ceremony. So we enter the story and the story enters us. I'm realizing in the telling of the story that now that you're far away, I don't need these. <laughs> now I can see you better. <clears throat> so as they say, once upon a time, or once below a time, or once sitting somewhere in the cosmic universe of 
the internet somewhere around the world in front of your computer screen in a place you think is in time. There was a village. Now they say this village existed a long, long way from here. Matter of fact, it was so far from here, they say it was further east than the sun and further west than the moon. And this village, this village existed in a time, a long time ago. Long, long time ago. So long ago, it's older than the pine needles on the trees, older than the stones in the mountain. And in that place and in that time, there was a village. And in that village, <clears throat> there stood a circle of warriors, shoulder to shoulder, facing outwards around the lodge. And within that circle of warriors, standing shoulder to shoulder, facing outwards around this lodge, within that lodge, there sat a circle of grandmothers facing inwards. And within that circle of grandmothers facing inwards was a woman bringing new life into her village. And outside this lodge, could be heard sounds of drumming and singing and rattling and prayers of gratitude to the ancestors, prayers of gratitude for this new life that was coming into this village. For they knew that this new life was carrying some important medicine. They knew that this little one coming into the village had made agreements with their ancestors before coming here about the medicine that they were to carry and about the ancestors that were also carrying this medicine that would support them once they arrived here. And soon you could hear sounds coming out of that lodge, out from that circle of warriors standing around the lodge. You could hear sounds of deep breathing and grunting and screaming and more prayers of gratitude and drumming and singing the way you sometimes hear deep breathing, grunting and screaming and praying when a woman is bringing new life into her village. And as lightning touched the ground beside that village, as the lightning touched the ground beside that village, the cries of this infant child could be heard. And this infant child, having now just arrived in this village, wanting to open up their mouth, open up their eyes, open up their message and say why they had come, and also speak about the medicine that they were bringing. To this village. And when they did, when they opened their mouth, all that came out were cries and breathing and more cries and more breathing. And so this infant child, this little spirit child, knew that they should wait and learn the language of their people before they spoke about why they were here. time would have it, one season turned round the wheel to the next, and around and round the wheel the seasons went. And this little one, having arrived in this world, had one foot in that world of the ancestors, and now one foot in this world of this village. And they had to make a decision. Where were they going to place both their feet? And so this little spear child decided to 
plant both their feet into this physical world, into this village. And they did. And as they did, this vague feeling of disconnection, it was very subtle and vague at first, began to grow inside of them. They still held on to the memories of the agreements they had made with their ancestors before coming here, but they could not yet speak about them in the language of their people that they found themselves in. And so as the wheel turned from one season to the next and one year to the next, and the distance between those two worlds grew, this child, this girl child, began to forget. Usually happens around five or six when that soft spot in the center of our brain begins to close up. We begin to lose that connection with the other world. And as the forgetting set in, the loneliness began to grow. loneliness grew and grew and grew, as did the child, as did this girl. As she grew, her loneliness grew. And as is often the case, as you and I well know that, you know, sometimes when you feel things really strongly on the inside, somehow, somehow they start to get mirrored to you from the outside. And it gets a little confusing where it started. Almost seems like it started outside of us. And that's what happened here. So the other girls in the village began to ignore her, began to shun her, began to turn their backs, sometimes talking behind her back, whispers. <laughs> not allowing her to join them in their play and in their cre creativity. And that deep loneliness, that longing for connection and belonging grew immense in this girl. And then she grew to that place, that place you know well, that place of fixed in between. That place where you're no longer where you were, but you're not yet where you're headed. You're betwixt and between. That place, you know, around 14, they say, or 24, they say, or 34, or 44, or 54, or 64, or 74, 84, that place, that betwixt and between place, you know it. You may be there right now. You may remember it. You may find yourself sliding into it. Well, she grew to that place. And she found herself walking down one day towards the river, coming to the edge of the woods by the river and pausing. And as she paused, she looked down at the water's edge and she saw the other girls down there playing. making tools, tanning hides, painting drums. <clears throat> and then she noticed something very peculiar. She noticed that none of the girls wore their necklace. None of them had it on. And this was very odd because you, you never took off your necklace. You see, your necklace spoke of the clan that you belong to. Your necklace spoke of your identity and your place. And yet as she looked down there, none of them had their necklace on and she found herself, her own fingers, beginning to finger her own necklace around her throat. And we could say at this point that maybe 
maybe the desire to fit in <coughs> had surpassed the desire to be oneself. Likely that was the case because she stepped out of the woods and she walked down towards that water and she said to the other girls, where have you put your necklace? I will put mine there too. And the girl stepped forward and said, oh, we took our necklaces off and we threw them into the river. We made an offering to the spirit of the river. Hearing this, the girl remembered something her grandmother had told her about how to listen to the spirit of the river. And upon remembering this, she did not question that. And so she took off her necklace and she walked over to the edge of the water and she said prayers of gratitude for her life, prayers of gratitude for the lives of her ancestors. And without hesitation, she released her necklace to the spirit of the river as an offering. Because that is who she was. At that moment, the other girls began to circle around her, laughing, teasing, pushing her, saying, you fool, you fool. Did you think we would be so naive as to throw our necklace into the river? pushing her down in the soil beside the water, walking over to the banks beside the river and reaching into the muddy bank, they all pulled their necklaces out. And there she was, as they walked away, lying there beside the river, feeling that deep cut of betrayal Maybe the betrayal of an innocent discernment. Maybe the betrayal of another who she had put that trust in. Maybe both. And lying beside the river with tear-stained cheeks alone by the water's edge is where we're going to pause the story. <clears throat> So slide you in closer. <clears throat> Return to my reading glasses. <clears throat> and say, at this point, I want to go into the uh, to breakout rooms. <clears throat> and remembering those questions I asked you in the beginning before we started the story. Where did you, where did you first enter the story? What was happening there? Or where did you stop in the story? Maybe you got stuck somewhere and the story kept going. Or where might have you have left the story and gone into one of your own stories that was reflected in this story? And where did you go? Um, so how many people do we have been? I'll switch back to the um, gallery view. Yeah, 56. 56 people, okay. <clears throat> so if we um, do the math real quick, text. I would do, uh, I would do, I would just do uh, seven groups, which would be like eight people per group. Okay, so we'll do seven groups um, and we're gonna put y'all automatically in breakout rooms. Um, to discuss amongst the, uh, however many that is when you divide that up, um, just take a moment to share um, what stirred for you. What did you notice uh, for yourself in that part of the story? And, um, and then you'll see, uh, you'll see a message eventually where you have a minute left. Um, I'm thinking, I don't know how many people that'll put in rooms, what's that like? eight people in a room or something. Um, so I'm going to create seven rooms. And um, so I'll give you all maybe uh, 15 minutes there and then bring you all back. 
So, and what you'll experience if you haven't done this, you'll just automatically disappear from the screen and end up in a smaller room with a fewer people. Looks like you did it. You're still there. Well, I clicked uh, later just so I can make sure everybody's getting to their rooms. Um, looks like we still have a few here. Will there, will there be a room left here? You'll be the only one left in there. Okay. You okay. should, unless it brings you to another room. Um, it has me as in group uh, two, which I can join. I was making sure everybody was Looks like can clicking you, out of here. Why don't you stay here with me, if you can? Sure. A lot of times the ones with the videos off won't sometimes see it. Or um, like uh, Marie, Alice, if you can hear us. Um, did you see a button that says join a room or later option? Um, no, I don't see that. It might be that we're... You can do it manual on your end too, Cater. What's that? You can switch her to a room. But I just, I just transferred it onto my PC because I was on That's my other why. computer and I did not have any camera. So maybe so the time we... which I'm, I missed out on something. Yeah, and you can do it manual on your end, Cater, since you're the host. Because these other no, people I'm might sure be listening in and not. So I'm going okay. to uh, pause the recording. Sure. I'm starting the recording again as everybody's coming back into the main room. <clears throat> welcome back, welcome back. Got just over half back, I guess they're still coming back. <clears throat> All right, is everybody back, Ben? Looks like it. Three pages of people. You're missing a few, but they, uh, some, I did see a couple of people drop off um, right before breakouts. Um, so they might be coming back on or could have okay. been a tech issue. Um, they could have gotten lost in the dark walking out to their campfires to talk. Um, who knows? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Do people know which group? You don't really know which group you were in, do you? in terms of number. So I can't ask for one person from me. Oh, you do know. Awesome. They, they should know. OK. <clears throat> so maybe we can have uh, if one person. I'll just speak up from each one of the groups and share like a theme, something that came up. And we'll just take you know, maybe a minute, not long, because we have more story to get into. So. Anybody that would like to share uh, a few, a few, maybe not even a minute, but just a few seconds of a theme, a, a potent piece of something that came up for you or for your group. And Kate, you might want to give them the raise their hand and I can help you uh, pick okay. them out for you. Um, see, I can only see one of three pages, but um, so if you raise your hand, I see Audra raising her hand. Yeah, go ahead and unmute. My name's Maya, and my mom's right next to me, Audra. Hi, Cater. It's Audra. Hey, Audra. And, but um, Maya. what came up in our group was a sacred place that you have. Oh, like, beautiful. Or, like it could be man-made or out in nature. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that, Maya. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me share. Absolutely. 
<laughs> That's a hard one to follow up. Um, oh, Libby's raising her hand. Libby. Hi. Um, our group uh, just sort of came to the realization that this young lady was uh, uh, quite a uh, an advanced soul and that the other girls were probably uh, much less advanced and they knew that and because of that they shunned her and uh, that she she made this offering a genuine ceremony she she didn't just walk over and throw her necklace in the river she mm -hmm. she made a sacred ceremony of doing it and we feel that that because of that this probably will end up being a positive thing all right we shall see thank you libby who else uh kimberly hughes had her hand raised I was actually in Maya's group and she spoke already eloquently oh. for us, but I will just say that I fell in love with Maya during our group. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, Kater, I'm seeing Marie, Alice. Yes. Elise. Yes, Mary Alice. Alice. Um, well, I was with group one. So we talked uh, on the fact of uh, be wanting to belong to a group and then finding our own identity. So there was this, um, we talked about wounds too. The wound of maybe uh, uh, betrayal or, or rejection or abandonment, but mostly collective <laughs> The collective because there was a sacred ritual where she where the little girl believed in a sacred ceremony and she went for it mm -hmm. and so i think that part was collective and then while the others moving is like an opposite an opposition between the collective and our own identity mm -hmm. thank you marie and uh, Judy, uh, Judy Brightman. I'm sorry. I just wanted to add something quick. We also talked about remembering. Remembering. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Go ahead, Judy. Thank you. Um, in our group, um, there were a few things that came up. Uh, for a number of us, it was the circle and the drums and just the whole um, spiritual aspect of, of the sacredness of the birth um, and the place. I grew up in Africa, so I just, you know, every time I hear this story, I just am back there and taken straight <laughs> back to the many times I've sat in Africa, you know, drumming and in sacred ceremony. But the, another thing that came up um, was the kind of almost that liminal space where she has one foot um, in the spirit world and one foot in um, this world. And, and, you know, she makes the decision to join and then the forgetting, you know, the sort of, as that slowly happens, that was a, that impacted a number of people where they were brought into the story um, and the lightning strike. Um, there were several people who just felt that really brought them into the um, story, just that, you know, kind of pay attention sort of message um, from the world that really jolted them into the story and just the fact that this is important, this is significant. And in fact, one of our group um, shared that she has had three houses struck by lightning. So um, that was where she came in, with, you know, a couple of people that came in at that point. So those were the three very significant themes that came through. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Judy. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, I think the... Since, since I'm practicing, this is Joan. Oh. 
since I'm practicing getting my voice, and then since nobody spoke from my group, yeah, you guys, I don't know. You got to help me here. Um, let me turn my light on so I can breathe. Jot it down. Uh, what I ended up with is that is that we don't have that we uh, okay. What happened is that I was having trouble with the internet, so I came into the story in the middle or who knows when. Mm -hmm. Drums, absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Um, but um, <clears throat> what occurred to me at the very end of all our discussion and all the input was that is that we all we we always come into the middle of our we're always in the middle of our story <laughs> and also the, the the way this segment ended it was also that there is no ending if there's mm -hmm. there's she's still developing she's still morphing and so um uh that and that parallel with our own experience no matter what story we're telling that seems to be like sort of what the progression of the story is. There's some kind of transformation that happens. And yes, the identification with the bullying, we had, you know, all our females uh, have experienced that and the rejection and the, the shunning. And I loved it with what I think one of our people said it, it was, or maybe it was the thing about being shunned because your light is too bright. Mm -hmm. and um <coughs> they don't uh, they have to block that and and keep that out because uh, you know that thing of being in another world so anyway uh, thank you yes thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much yeah and cater you had uh one more hand raised during that time and that was uh papa joe all right papa joe we'll do one more and dive back into the watery currents so I was in group six and uh, di different people had different places where they came in and came out of it, but pretty much everybody <laughs> was aligned when the uh, story began picking up mm -hmm. space on the tr down at the river. Um, everybody was there for that. Um, and nobody dropped out till you said stop. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, another place where pretty much everybody was connected was when you were describing the grandmothers. A lot of people had um, deep connections to that. Uh, one person said they had a difficult time with the drum because the drum pulled them out, out of the story, but they still were there for the river. And uh, I think um, some of us didn't lose it at all. We, we started out with it and followed through the story. But so they were in the seven, seven of us that were there, six of us spoke and um, four, I think, yeah, well, like I said, some people were in and out. Some people did, had a difficult time holding it and um, some people stayed all the way through. But everybody was there for the river and I think everybody was there for the grand place. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Papa Joe. I'll say this as we, um, before we go back into the story, if you find yourself in a relational dynamic with the drum, um, don't treat the drumming or the sound of drumming as getting in the way of what you're trying to hear. Go simply go into the drum and see what is there. Because what's happening is this, this medicine piece that we're working with in this drum is also telling part of the story. And so you're, you're being called to the drum. Um, so it would be uh, a, just a simply a different way to think about it as opposed to thinking of it as getting into way of something you're trying to hear something else is no the drum is what you're hearing listen to that where does that where does that take you drums are instruments to travel on and so if the drums call in your attention you may find you you may find yourself to be one of those people that journeys very easily with the drum All right, so we're gonna, um, anybody have a burning desire to share? <clears throat> All right, we're gonna dive back into the story. I'm gonna switch back over to speaker view. And Ben, are you there? Can you hear me, Ben? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. 
Let me slide this back. Help me adjust my screen so it's. <clears throat> yeah, a little down there. Is that good? Is at least the yeah. top of the drum visible? Yeah, it's definitely visible on my end. Okay, so where were we? We were down at the river. <clears throat> So there she was, lying by the edge of the water. Slowly, she propped herself up on her elbow and sat up. Slowly, she stood up because this is who she was. And she began to walk upstream beside the river as if walking against the current, walking into that dark night. That dark night filled with questions. That dark night filled with memories and confusion and deep feelings. Questions, memories, deep feelings. And she walked a long time into that dark night. We don't know how long it really was. The story never tells us how long she walked in that dark night. But you've been in those dark nights. Sometimes they last a long time. Maybe she walked all the way from 14 to 24, or 34, or 44, or 54, 64, 74, 84, 94. We don't know how long it was that she walked. But she did walk a long time in that dark night of questions and memories and feelings and confusion. <clears throat> there was some time in the early morning hours, that very quiet time before the, before the false dawn. She heard a sound bubbling up from the river itself at that moment. Walking closer to the water's edge, she could hear that sound more clearly now. Plunge in, the river said. Plunge in, the river said. And being who she was, she walked over to that river, remembering once again the counsel of her grandmother about listening to the spirit of the river, and she did not question this. She went over to the water's edge and stood on that stone outcropping above the water, above that dark black water in the night. She said prayers of gratitude for her life, and prayers of gratitude for the lives of her ancestors. jumped down 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 beneath the surface of the water she went and as the silt settled on the bottom of that river the way silt settles you know when it's been disturbed the water begins to clear as the silt settled around her at the bottom of that river. She looked across and she saw a firelight. Some 30 yards away, maybe this fire was burning. She walked closer to this fire and as she got closer to the fire, she saw that sitting by the edge of this fire was an old woman. This old woman sitting there by the fire with a stick, stirring the coals and keeping them hot. As she stepped closer towards the firelight, she noticed that this old woman had cuts and wounds and bruises all over her body. Some may have called her a, a old river hag. And as she stepped closer toward the old river hag, stirring those coals with that stick, 
the old river hag looked up from that fire and looked into the eyes of that girl and said, lick my wounds, the old river hag said. Lick my wounds, the old river hag said. Now this girl, being who she was, knew that she was not in the ordinary world any longer. She was at the bottom of a river and there was a fire and there was this old river hag. This was certainly not the ordinary world. So she stepped even closer to the old river hag. And following the direction from this old river hag, she picked up her arm and began to lick those wounds, those cuts, those bruises. And as she licked those wounds, it was very faint at first, almost like a, a pinprick of light that began, began to shine in the belly of the old woman. And that light, it grew. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew. Until the body of the old woman was filled with light, light pouring out of her eyes and those cuts those wounds, those bruises, they were healed. And the girl now stepping back, looking at this old river hag, the old river hag stood up and the girl noticed this was a giant river hag. She towered above this girl. And the river hag reached her arms out and scooped this child up in her arms. Now this girl, not familiar with this level of intimacy, this level of closeness, began to squirm. And the squirming began to turn to a little frustration. And that frustration began to grow and it turned into anger. And that anger began to grow and that anger turned into rage. And the old river hag the old river hag held fast. And this rage, this rage began to pour out of this girl. So much anger, so much rage. She herself didn't know where it was all coming from. Maybe it wasn't all hers. Maybe it had existed a long time before she was even born in her ancestral lineage. She didn't know, all she knew was coming out of her now is so much rage that the surface on top of that river began to bubble on the surface. So much rage. The the old river hag held fast. Fierce compassion held onto this child. Fierce compassion. And then the rage began to settle down into frustration and anger and began to quiet into annoyance and slight discomfort and then began to settle into the quiet of the river. And this girl felt a peace come over her she hadn't felt before. And the old river hag was still holding with fierce compassion. And then there was one. And then two. And then tens and dozens and hundreds and thousands of tears began to flow from the eyes of this child. And this crying and lamenting turned into wailing. The wailing and the lamenting was so strong, so powerful, so much grief pouring out of this one that the river rose three feet that day. Now the girl, she didn't even know where it was all coming from. Maybe it wasn't even all hers. Maybe it had been there a long time before she was even born, somewhere along those ancestral threads of unacknowledged grief. She didn't know, but it was coming through her now. And that old river hag held fast to this girl. 
Soon the wailing and the lamenting began to soften and quiet and quiet and soften until she lay motionless and quiet. And she felt a peace wash over her she had never ever recalled feeling before. And then there was a sound in the river that disrupted the water. And the old river hag said, quick, into this lodge. And the girl looked to the side and there it was, there was a, a, a lodge covered in hides. It stood about four feet off the ground with a flat door about eight foot diameter the old river said, quick, hide in this lodge. And the girl went into the lodge. The old river had closed the flap on the lodge. <coughs> and up came the river demon. The river demon said, I smell somebody in my river. And they're mine, the river demon said. They belong to me and I'm going to find them. Where are they? And the old river hag looked at that river demon and laughed said, <laughs> Oh, you'll never catch her. She was fast. She left out of here yesterday. She left into the west. No, wait a minute. It was two days ago and it was east. Yes. Two days ago, she was running east. Well, wait a minute. I'm, I get confused. I'm kind of old. It could have been south. It may have been three days ago. She went south. I don't know. But wherever she went, you'll have to hurry if you're going to catch her. River Demon took off. And the water began to quiet again. <clears throat> the old river hag raised the flap on the lodge and the girl came out. The girl now standing in front of this old river hag, wanting to speak words of gratitude for the healing and gratitude for the protection. She started to open her mouth, and before she could utter a word, the old river hag simply clapped her hands. And out of the river, she came, landed on the banks of the river this woman did. This woman landed on the bank of that river. And in the water, deep down in the water, she heard another thunderous clap. And out of the river came this necklace that landed beside her. And she looked down at this necklace and she noticed that this necklace had stones and metals and bones and jewels and things that had never been seen before in this land. They weren't from this land. But she recognized this necklace to be her medicine. And this woman picked up that necklace. And as she stood feeling a little bit unstable, the way you sometimes feel a bit unstable when you've been in that other world, working to remember something, working to heal something, something that had been forgotten, or something that had been stolen, or something that had been lost. Now standing firm and clear and strong beside the river, putting that necklace on, there. So we're going to send you back into the breakout rooms again. And uh, with the same questions, what themes, what, what medicine stirred in you, uh, where you got, where in the story did you get stuck? Or I won't even say the word stuck, where did you stop? Uh, remembering that stuck implies that you're somewhere you shouldn't be. <laughs> So I'd say, where did you stop in the story? Because that's where the most medicine is. Or where did, did you leave that story and go somewhere else? And where did you go? Um, or maybe where did you enter it and what was happening there? So we'll send you back to the breakout rooms as we did before. Um, and then we'll return back here in about 10 minutes.
Hello. Hello. Did you not end up in a breakout room, Elizabeth? I just arrived uh, a little while ago, so I hadn't been to a previous breakout room. Okay, we can we can drop you into one here. Okay. Let me find one that's needing some people. All right, we'll send you to room two. Same for me. And for uh, Chris, if you can, Cater okay. and Deborah. Hey, Deborah. So, uh, Chris and Deborah. Thank you. Let me find out which room Thank needs you. people. Okay. Um, Deborah, we'll put you in two. Is this two? And Elizabeth. Let's see. I'm trying to find a room that needs some extra folks. Um, seven. Thank you for doing this, by the way. Oh, you're quite welcome. All right, Grace, we're going to put you, what's your favorite number between one and seven? Me? Yeah. Yes, Grace. Grace. Or, or no, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Yeah, Elizabeth. Room. I thought I put Elizabeth in a room. Um, so we might have put her in. I'm still here. I yeah. think it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> this might be the room. Well, let me put Grace in a room. I, I'll take this room. Yeah, Grace, Ayla, and Tomo, like a member of, had their videos off for a while, so I don't know if okay. they might just be listening in. And Elizabeth. You see more of yourself on these Zoom calls than any, you know, know. any other time. Hmm. Well, become Zoom experts these days. I don't see your name on the rooms here. Let me see if you came in while I was had that open. No? Could, could have been. Oh, you, Ben, you came late too? Ben's the moderator. Oh, he wasn't late. He's stuck here with me. Hmm. <laughs> um, stuck implies that you are where you're not supposed to be. That's it, that's right. <laughs> And if you're with me, you might want to. You might have some questions about is this where you're supposed to be. I'm happy being here. I I'm honored. <laughs> well, this says you're in room seven, Elizabeth. But am I? Yeah, Elizabeth, look on your screen. You'll oh, see a button. Oh, okay. Join it. Yes, yes. join it. There you go. She just didn't click the button. Okay. I was going to say she wasn't in my little thing here. No, and then make sure uh, I can click stop the recordings. We don't want to record all that. Okay, the recording. So we're starting recording again. And people still filtering back in. We had three three pages of people. Maybe we're down to two. People are dropping out. You just bounced back up to three here, so you're okay. coming back slowly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm still only seeing two pages. We lost a whole page of people, and that uh, maybe they're stuck in that. Uh, vortex of a breakout room. All right, why don't we begin? If they come back, they'll come back. But let's, uh, let's open it up for some sharing from each of the groups about what, what, uh, what came up in your group that you want to, what, what medicine you want to offer us from your circle. Yes, Amy. Um. Our group talked about a lot of things. Um, one was the courage that was needed and the commitment on the part of the girl to jump in this dark river at night and to lick the wounds of the river hag. And we also talked about the necessity of feeling these deep emotions that maybe had been suppressed or not fully experienced in order to create the healing. And we talked about the river hag being the facilitator for the healing that the girl was able to experience all these emotions from 
her ancestors and that's what perhaps really created the healing and then led to her receiving her medicine we talked about a lot of stuff that's the summary <laughs> yeah it was it was a potent part of the story that that on the world journey thank you okay. who else Kater, uh, Laura, doctor, just raised her hand. Okay, Laura. There, uh, I was group three, and um, we had a, a lot to say too, but I think the one thing that I'm noticing is that the deeper we go into the story, the deeper um, awareness is that I feel like everybody's bringing to the table. Um, we also talked about the river hag and the metaphor of licking the wounds being a metaphor for um, our tending to our own wounds, mm -hmm. tending to our own personal wounds. Mm -hmm. And and we discussed the grief and um, how most of us in the group felt that we've been feeling that grief, grief really deeply lately. And, and having to grieve it in some way. So, yeah. All right, thank you, Laura. Yeah. Who else? Uh, Summer. Yeah, just one of the things I'd like to add, I was in Laura's group and um, we were talking about how the river hag held the girl all the way through every single emotion and and i and i loved the line when you said kadar about about um it being um um completely compassionate um so i just yeah just really recognize that um understanding that that there needs to be something set up for people to be able to express grief and be held without any kind of judgment to go into those really deep places and go all the way through it um yeah thank you summer well Any other groups want to share anything? If you want to heal, you have to go into the river. Yes, ma'am. This is this is true. <clears throat> there, there's an old uh, understanding in uh, in regards to the river and the fires that those that are those that uh, want to go into the fire end up in the water and those that want to go into the water well they end up in the fire <laughs> anything else All right. it's interesting that you said that about the river and the fire because uh several people in our group was struck uh, on how she was in the river and then there was a fire. So I like how that mm -hmm. ties into that. Mm -hmm. Right. These, these elemental, uh, because they are elemental ancestors of uh, where fire is the, the doorway or gatekeeper to the other world and water is that of this world of life. So ash, when we make offerings of ash, we say to offer ash with your left hand is, is that it shows up as fire in the other world. And so offerings of water and ash are those of, of kind of both worlds. Um, but yeah, they're very closely aligned. These uh, um, ancestral, elemental ancestors. Um, Kater, you have a uh, family share and your sister wants to share. Oh, does she? Where is she? I'm She's right page here. Two. Page two. <laughs> um, yeah, group two, I'll represent. <laughs> um, yeah, a theme for our group that it seemed um, 
a, a prevalence of really feeling moved, deeply moved and um, by the emotion within as the story called it forth and um, a recognition of the grief and the rage in the world and how important that needs to be held with the fierce compassion for the healing for both the planet and for the individuals in the world um, that are really struggling um, with the, this wasn't stated, but I'm, I'm guessing with the divisiveness and um, that seems to be so prevalent right now culturally. Thank you, B. Thank you. Okay, any other burning, Marie, and something to share? So your hand go up for a moment. Your, your mic is still muted. Well, I was hoping someone else would talk for my group, but I, <laughs> so uh, we talked a lot also, um, the, the, the idea of the river being a representative of our ancestors of all the planetary lineage uh, and the rage and all of it coming up. Uh, and this girl taking everything into her with unconditional love. And by doing so, she was protected in the lodge. And when she came back, she was given this necklace with, uh, with new tools, with new um, uh, uh, strengths that she had, but did not know she had. Mm -hmm. There might be something else, but that's what comes up. Mm -hmm. And we'll see what happens in the story. All right, are we ready to return? Uh, I'm surprised nobody from Seven spoke. We, they were so wise. Well, Seven, you have any words for us? Is it the silence, the, the <laughs> wisdom to be shared? Elizabeth, you share your wisdom. Well, I came in the middle of the story, so I'm coming in partially baptized. Because <laughs> the river is always a cleanser, often a cleanser. And just, you know, it could be cleansing and joy. And then it was, t I, I, I mentioned that it rose three feet from the tears that were shed. And that was astounding to me. You know, that's a lot of tears. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I really liked what the woman, who, I didn't get her name, who spoke a minute ago about how embracing with compassion to those who are so angry, but um, I'm gonna stop here. Fierce compassion. The old river hag held on with fierce compassion. We say anger is petrified grief. And uh, someone who is deeply angry, we say that's someone on the road to grief and the sooner they get there, the better for them and for us. <laughs> so we don't, we don't shy away from the anger either because we just know that underneath that, the grief will be there and we'll, we'll hold it all. All right, so we're going to switch back to, let's see, Ben, you there? Just say yes. Yes. I put you on the forefront of my screen so we can chat. Okay, so I'm going to slide this back, help me get my visual cue set. All right. You can lower your uh, screen a little bit more there. Yeah. Oh, too low. Oh, too low. How's that? Perfect. You're you're a pro at this now. <clears throat> okay. So we find her now standing, standing beside the river, <clears throat> putting on this necklace feeling a bit wobbly, as we say, the, the way you feel a bit wobbly when you've come back from the other world, remembering something about who you are and the medicine that you, uh, that you came into this world to deliver. 
and she began to make her way back towards the village. She didn't know how long she'd been gone. Maybe it had been a couple of weeks. Maybe it had been a decade or 20 years. We don't know. The story doesn't really tell us how long she had been down in that river. It's kind of hard. Time does funny things when you're down in the river. So she made her way back towards the village and she came once again to the edge of the woods where the village descended down toward the river and she paused and she once again saw some young girls down by the water's edge playing, painting drums, tanning hides, making tools in conversation and she studied them for a moment. And then she stepped out of the edge of the woods and began walking down towards the girls. And they all spun their heads around really quickly looking at this woman and said, where did you get that necklace? We want one of those necklaces. Where can we find one of those necklaces? And being who she was, she simply said, I, I got this from the spirit of the river. And they said, well, we want one of those necklaces and we're gonna get one. And they went running towards the river. And the woman said, wait! But it was too late and they had all jumped down, down, down to the bottom of the river they went. As the silt settled around their feet, some 30 yards away, these girls saw a fire. And as they neared the fire, they saw an old woman sitting by that fire with a stick, stirring the coals and keeping them hot. Walking over to this old river hag, they, they said, Oh woman, where can we get one of those necklaces? Well, this old river hag wasn't one much for answering questions, you know, especially these kind of questions. And she simply looked at these girls. Well, you know what she said. She said, lick my wounds. Well, now they hadn't noticed it before. They were too focused on mourning this necklace, but now they did notice that this old woman had cuts and wounds and bruises all over her body. And these girls looked at her and said, got to be crazy. We're not touching you, old woman. We just want one of those necklaces. You tell us where we can find one of those necklaces and we'll be on our way. Well, the old woman just simply said, lick my wounds. And they said, woman, you're crazy. And they turned their backs on the old woman and began to walk away. And then they heard a sound in the river. And they turned around real quick and said, what's that? What's that? <clears throat> and the old river hag said, that's the river demon. You better run because he's looking for you. And so they took off running. And the river demon took off after him. And they ran, and the demon ran. And some say they're still down there running. But back in that village, there walked a woman. A woman who stood clear and strong in her medicine. And this woman built her lodge on the perimeter of that village so that she could see everybody in the village from her vantage point outside of her lodge. And she would watch those villagers and she would notice when those ones grew to that place of betwixt and between, no longer where they were, not yet where they're headed. She would notice them by the 
the way they seem to walk or their silence about them. And she would go over to them and say, I'd like to take you down to the river and teach you how to remember, how to listen to the spirit of the river, the way our grandmothers taught us. And so she would take these ones down to the river. Sometimes one would go down to the river with this woman and they would quickly come back from the river back into the village muttering something, that crazy woman? What is she talking about, spirits of the river? I don't know what she's talking about. I didn't hear anything, but we know what they heard down there at the river. They refused to, to acknowledge it. Others would go down to the river with this woman and disappear, never to return. Maybe, maybe they join the other ones down there running from that demon, still running. And yet many would go down to the river with this woman and they would vanish for a while, maybe a week, maybe five years, we don't know. But soon enough, they would return with some very important medicine. They would return to the village or maybe go to another village to deliver the medicine that they had remembered. Those agreements they had made with their ancestors in that other world about what they were bringing into this world to deliver. And so this Nubian woman lived her life in that village, offering the medicine of helping those remember how to listen to the spirit of the river. Now at this point, you might say, well, Cater, that was a pretty interesting story but didn't you say that was like a long time ago? What, how long ago? Um, older than the pine needles on the trees. And didn't you say that was a long way from here? It's like, it's not even near here. It was, it's so far from here, it's further east than the sun and west than the moon. Like that's a long way off and a long time ago. There aren't villages like that anymore, probably. People would much rather be distracted and entertained. And if that were true, I suspect you probably wouldn't be here tonight. So I'm imagining maybe this virtual village that we're in is that village. Listen right now. Can you hear it? That river. Do you hear the sound of that river? <clears throat> Plunge in, the river says, plunge in. <clears throat> so we could say the story ends, the story ends with an invitation to begin. Plunge in, the river says. <clears throat> so it's a story that is uh, an invitation to the initiatory journey. Um, to the descent. Um, and yet, now then, hearing the whole story, we won't go into breakout rooms again, but just noticing where do you place yourself in that story? Where do you find yourself now in the entirety of the story as the Nubian woman? And once you find yourself in the story, then what is the medicine that's in that part of the story that's being offered to you 
Remember, this is not about understanding the outcome or the meaning of the story, but what is your relationship to that point of the story that you are finding yourself in? <clears throat> and as I like to, to say when I, when I wrap up things like this is, um, after this evening is over, or if it's daytime for some of you, or late in the night, um, don't struggle so much with what does all that mean? Um, because remember, the meaning is like the river itself. It's very fluid, and you can't hold meaning. What it means tonight will be something different than what it means next week. So you can't grasp a meaning. It's, again, like trying to grasp water. So don't search for meaning. Ask yourself the question in light of uh, where I'm in relationship to this story, in light of where I find myself in relationship with this story, what action am I guided to take? What action am I guided to take? And I don't mean with your life, because that's a big one, you know. I mean... Maybe uh, when you get up tomorrow morning or when you leave the room and move into the day or the next time you see your friend or your children or your loved ones, what action am I guided to take? And I say, if, if the action that comes to you to take falls within the banks of your, your integrity, your integrity is the flow of the river and the banks is kind of that. That's what holds your integrity, the integrity that holds that. So if it fits within that for you, do that action. And um, a little formula when you ask the question, what action in light of where I find myself in relation to this story, what action am I guided to take? Keep the action close in. Again, not what am I going to do with my life? Um, but close in in time and space. Matter of fact, the and the closer you bring it to you, the question, the less understanding you'll probably have with the action that you're guided to take. So if, if you leave this storytelling and you ask that question right in the moment, within the next five, like in the next five minutes, what action am I guided to take? And it says, I want you to walk outside and lay down under the moonlight and just breathe. Well, you don't know what, you might not know why that is, but just go do it. Or if it says, you know, walk into the other room and, and tell somebody you love them or sit with your children or something, you know, you don't, don't worry about why, just, just go do it. Because what you're doing is you're, put your, you're putting yourself in a relational conversation with the sacred in which you don't know why but you know what you're guided, what the guidance is. Um, and remember that why is all, is most of the time why is in front of us. It's not something that happened, but it's something that is decided by the actions we take, by how you live your life will determine why. So if we say, well, why did you listen to the story this night? Well, if we come back here in a couple of months, then you tell me why, by what you did, as opposed to what was behind you. We say when you when you ask questions about why and you turn around backwards, we say that's walking backwards in life. <laughs> Tend to run into things that you don't want to run into, or run into the same thing. So, um, so it's a little formula I've learned about uh, entering into conversation with the sacred uh, by not searching for meaning, but asking what in light of this experience, what action am I guided to take and bring it close in so it's not way out in front of you. You know, you can bring it into just a few minutes. You can bring it into 60 seconds. I might say, turn around, turn around three times clockwise and light that candle on your desk and sit down. And you have no idea why you're doing that, but that's what it says. And so you do it. And then once you do the action, pay attention to what you notice next. That's why I say you enter into a, a conversation with the sacred um, that doesn't require you to know what's going on. Um, it just requires you to be in, in, in conversation with it. And um, when you approach the sacred with a, 
an open heart and with some humility, then the sacred will approach you. Um, it's like we say, we can only, we, know, we can only make ourselves available to grace. You can't choreograph grace. Um, you just make yourself available to it and see if it shows up. Um, so again, this is a story from Nubini, Africa, a story of the initiatory descent and return, uh, descent into um, ancestral waters of remembering and healing and belonging and then the return, uh, having remembered the true medicine that, that she carried and then delivering that medicine to her village. Um, I skipped over breaking down every section of the story and giving you my input on all the various parts um, because that would take much more time than we had allotted for tonight since we're already over our time. Um, but that was just a trick to get you all to show up. Um, just tell you it was only an hour and a half when it was really two. <laughs> so, in closing, if those of you that uh, are willing to ask the question right now, maybe share something about, in light of my experiencing or being in a relationship with this story tonight, what action am I guided to take? And if anybody would like to have a closing comment or two about, about that as you leave this circle. I am going to listen more and follow more. Um, I often push things like this aside, um, but I need to listen more, take it in, and do it. Mm -hmm. Even if I don't get why. So that when I say keep it close in, you might say in the next 10 minutes after we close, do that and notice what happens. Mm. Anybody else? Thank you for sharing, Cindy. Is there some place I can find the story so I could have the whole, read the whole story or hear the whole story? Um, yes, this is recorded and it's gonna be put on our website. Um, what, so, what website is that? It's rightsofpassagecouncil.org. Right. I'm gonna type it into the bar here, type it into the chat. Okay. The rights of passage council.org. Did I send that? Let me send this to everybody. Okay, there you go. R I T E S of passage, P A S S A G E, council, C O U N C I L dot org. Sounds good, Matt. <laughs> okay. And um, yeah. so before y'all sign off, so yeah, this is um, the storytelling tonight is part of three stories. Um, the first story was told a month ago um, by another one of our staff members, Kat Houghton, um, so told uh, a story that's now on the website. This story will be put on the website and you'll be sent um, the link to it within a few days. Um, and then we'll have another story. Kat's going to tell another story uh, entitled The Wild Woman um, on March 31st. Um, and so anybody that signed up for this will also get an invitation to that. So we were just doing, um, as part of our offering during the spring, <clears throat> Rites of Passage Council was offering these three different storytelling experiences <clears throat> as an uh, invitation um, and if you want to plunge in um, with us, um, we have uh, coming up, we have a couple of vision quest ceremonies. These are 11 day uh, wilderness um, encampments with a four day, four night solo. Um, so we have one coming up in April, one coming up in May. Um, we have an ancestral grief ritual weekend that's coming up in June. 
Um, we have a, an introductory weekend that Kat is doing um, that's also on the website. So if you, if you go to our website, rightsofpassagecouncil.org, and click on the calendar page, um, you can find you know, the upcoming programs. Um, if you go to the website, and um, let me do this. I will show you. And click on the... share my screen with you all. Let's see, where's share screen? There it is, okay. That, so everybody can see that. This is our website, Rights of Passage Council. Um, like, like the story of the Nubian woman, great journeys often begin in darkness. Um, and then we have programs. You can see all the different things here. Um, under what we do, you see fireside inspirations, and there's poetry, stories, uh, recordings of interviews, um, different things there. Um, and these stories are listed there as well. Um, Stalking the Wild Twin is the story that Kat did um, a while back, just a month ago. And um, so this is the page where we'll put this story. Um, and we'll send you the link to the page. Um, this call, again, this is on the website. It's under what we do called, one of the things called Fireside Inspirations. They're, they're just free offerings, stories, videos, teachings, interviews, things like that. Um, and then um, our events calendar. This is what you just did, the storytelling event, Vision Quest in April. Um, the Road Ahead is an introductory weekend that's in May. And uh, May, Vision Quest. Those of you that are overseas, we have um, Vision Quest in Spain. Where's that? Coming up in October. Hopefully, given that I think we'll be able to travel, it's going to be in Spain. We have one spot left for that one. And then we have a year long training that begins in July. Um, and Rites of Passage Guide Training. Um, it's a year-long, 16-month-long uh, training process. Um, if you're interested in that, then the, the vision quest is a prerequisite to the training. But those are some, some weekend offerings um, and some deeper, deeper dives, if you wish to dive in deeper with us. Let me click that off and return back here to you. And um, so, yeah, hope, hope you all join Kat on the 31st for the telling of the wild woman story. So any questions? And you can also um, go to the website, email directly, email me directly, or even set up a 20 minute phone call with me um, if you want to talk about any of these things in more in depth. Um, but I will say, if you are interested in questing with us, um, the, the uh, April program is actually full. I noticed it said there was one spot left, but that's already gone. So the April program is full. The May program still has a few spots. Um, and if not, I hope to see you around this virtual, virtual fire again. Carrie, I didn't want to interrupt you, but Libby was raising her hand. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How long have you been doing this? I have been doing this. Um, what? So there are a lot of parts to this. I started. <laughs> <laughs> I started work as a um, a licensed therapist when I was twenty five. I'm now sixty one. I started blending ceremony and ritual and working with indigenous people when I was about twenty eight. And that morphed into eventually not doing traditional psychotherapy and more into doing blending um, clinical body-centered psychotherapy with ritual and ceremony. Mm -hmm. And then, so it kind of went, it went in that direction. Um, so the programs that I do now have been a kind of a culmination of all of those years of, of stuff. So um, 
I first did uh, started working doing Vision Quest apprenticeship with Stephen Foster and Meredith Little out at School of Lost Borders in 94 and started the Rites of Passage Council in 95 as a nonprofit organization. Um, so that's uh, that's a, a small <laughs> a small bit about the different different parts of what I've been doing. This was wonderful. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, well, hopefully get to we'll get to to circle up again here around the virtual fire, um, or in person if we're. Uh, if, if you want to join us for one of the in-person events. Any other questions? It was delightful. Oh, great. Glad you all enjoyed it. Bye, sister. I see you're signing off. <laughs> okay. Well, as a sign off, let's um, let's end by offering gratitude again from the from the sacred grounds in Africa, in the country of New Bini, from which this this particular story first came out of the ground, and made its way from there to Lawrence Vanderpost to Angeles area, and, and then to me, and now to you. Um, so, if it's a story that you, that uh, calls your attention to work with it, um, please do so. Uh, stories like this are not owned. Uh, they, they have a life of their own. Mm. Uh, and it's more like they'll work with you as long as they want to, and then they'll move somewhere else. Or maybe they'll, they'll set up shop for a long time um, and stay with you. It's a, it's a wonderful story to, uh, that speaks about that, uh, the willingness to do that difficult work. Um, that uh, a lot of people avoid. As I say, there's still still some down at the bottom of the river uh, refusing to face that demon. And uh, I'll, I'll give you this, this prologue. The demon often gets a bad rap in the story. <laughs> and the, the demon has a very important role. It's like the gatekeeper that calls our attention to what we don't want to look at. Um, and so I think, and, and somebody asked me one time, I said, well, why did the demon show up after the healing? Like, doesn't it show up on the way to the healing and all these things that get in our way? It's like, why after the, the girl went through all this amazing healing experience, why did the de demon show up then? I said, well, it's, it's uh, you know how it is when you've done an important piece of work or a trans you've had a transformative experience. Um, it's very vulnerable. And often something comes to try and extinguish it. Um, having grown up and, and, and uh, as a kid, grew up Catholic. And so what I'm remembering, even in the, those lineages of mythology and Christian mythologies, um, when Jesus was born, uh, you know, order went out from here to kill all the firstborn. This is like the demons coming. It's like, so when a bright light enters, there's a fragility. And so there's, so I say, oh, the demon's just reflective of that. I think one of you said it actually, that when there's a bright light, something wants to put it out. Um, and so it reminds us that when we've done deep work or had transformative experiences, we have to protect ourselves um, and not just kind of jump back out there um, because there are, there are people and, and forces that, um, how, how we say it, that um, would rather you lived your life in such a way that didn't make them uncomfortable with how they're living their life. <laughs> and that's not your job. Um, so yeah, praise be for the demon in the story. <laughs> All right. So thank you to the ancestors of the story. Thank you all for being with us tonight and uh, many blessings and go well and, and uh, send me a, 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 an email and let me know what action you took and, and more importantly, what happened next.
Good night, everyone. Go well.